keep interrupting. Thank you. Yes, hell yeah. Okay. I saw I saw the logo in my head. It's me in a red car hanging out the window. We're going live. That would be cool, right? Yeah. The dreads flying, hanging out the window. Hey, processing is in some kind of graffiti type of job. You could do that. Holy crap, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, we're live. Yep, we are live. Beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Friends and family. Friends and family. Friends and family. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so listen, today we have a special guest here, an amazing human being, I got to tell you this. Um, no, honestly, when I, when I see your post, when I see who you are, and who, I don't know who you were, but who you are is an amazing young man. Oh, we have, look, I see someone there. Oh my God, this is crazy. Now I can actually see someone who's in the building. Rock on, John says. Tobin, what's up? Good afternoon. We have a special guest in the building. And his name is Daryl Wilson, Dr. Daryl Wilson, a.k.a. the Punk Rock Doctor. And he said the broadcast is being interrupted, but we shall continue nonetheless. Rebecca is in the building. Hello, Rebecca. Hi. I can actually... Yes, this is amazing. Hello, hello, hello. I can do this. Yes. Oh, sorry, Daryl. Oh, I'm just getting carried, away. I'm getting carried away with the technology. <laughs> 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 like driving around Brooklyn looking for Wi-Fi. Listen, going? my brother, I, I, I went to a holistic doctor just now. Yeah. And um, I know I was supposed to go back uptown, but it took so long to get this consultation going on. And, and I was like, okay, I got to do it from wherever I am right now. So <laughs> I brought my laptop with me, and I had my phone, but I did not have Wi-Fi. And I'm not that so savvy where I can connect the phone's internet to the <laughs> laptop. So <laughs> forgive me. We have, we have ignition. We are online. We are here in the car session. Welcome. Yes, man, car set, you can move that anywhere. That's mobile. That's the mobile yes. app. You know, the mobile That's, app unit. That's this, what is the, a, this is the job I want. This is the job I want. This is the job I want, brother. <laughs> you see that, that, that job that you have? Yeah. It seemed intense. I just saw you on the lawn the other day. Yeah. So that's your that's your stuff. Yes. Yes. I mean the the the, the I mean the profession that I have chosen to do that I you know called to do and that I have done geez for over twenty five years I think it's it's been a while like my brain's addled now because it's been so long. Um, you know I, I I wanted to be a physician since I was you know seven years old and that came out of my understanding that I could feel that way too, and I feel it, and I have to be able to heal that, not only the myocardial infarction, but deal with the, the spouse of the individual who's thinking their, their spouse is going to die, or the child of the person that comes in when their elderly parent is septic and demented, and they are concerned about their well-being. So it's really hard because in emergency medicine, our, our interactions are transient. They are, they are quick. Um, it's not this long-term thing you build up as like a you know, family practitioner or an internal medicine physician would build up, but you still have to have that interaction with humans and make that connection real and make it quickly. Um, you know, it's, it's a performance in some sense. It's a performance. Like, you know, I can play in a punk rock band. That's a performance. You know, you, you got to get the crowd on your side because if you don't, they're going to tell you straight up. They're going to do it. You, know, too. you have to be able to make people comfortable and want to come into what you're selling, what you're doing, what you're putting out there. And my thing is trying to promote their well-being because of their health, promote their well-being because of what has to be done that may be a painful procedure that has to be done to make you better in the end. Um, so you have to build up trust really quick. And it's hard to do that with people nowadays. Trust is a hard thing to build, um, but you know, do it. So yeah, my, my jo the job's hard. Profession's hard, but you know what? It's not insurmountable. It's something we do every day. Well, when I, when, I, when I saw you, I mean, I've seen you with different posts and different situations. I've seen you mostly with the bag. Yeah. 
but a few days ago, you had a talk with your entire staff. Yeah. And explain them, explain to them where you were coming from and what it means to be a black man in America. Yes. And when, even when I, you know, I'm here as the director um, for all of you, and I don't know how many staff members is there. It's like mm -hmm. 20 or 30 or something like that. Yeah. Um, to to relate to them what it means to be a black man in America and being a doctor, being smart as you are, and then removing that jacket and removing that jacket, then you're you're diminished from being a doctor into being a target. Mm -hmm. That's that's what that's the gist that I got from what you were saying to them. Yeah, th I'm sure there's more. Yeah, and and that was you know so there was a you know um, we all were partaking in the event of white coats for Black Lives, and you know we we were all going to kneel for nine minutes um, to show that solidarity, and you know initially some discussions were. Individuals like, well, I don't want to kneel in the heat. I want to kneel in the shade. I'm going to do this. And I said from the very beginning, nine minutes in the sun is nothing. Your quote suffering of nine minutes in the sun is nothing for 400 years of oppression of individuals and for a man who now is no longer with us. So we'll all go out in the sun. We'll all kneel. You know, so we kneeled in the sun. You know, one of my colleagues, you know, Sangita wonderful, beautiful woman, she, her family, beautiful. Sagita, she actually had the Black Lives Matter sign in front of her and she was prone with her hands behind her back and did that for the nine minutes. And she was right in front of me. And I mean, think of it, she was moving me to tears because of her making that little bit of a sacrifice and that bit of being uncomfortable of laying there on her face, face down the way that George Floyd was laid face down. And, you know, we, we um, uh, you know, so we got done with the, the nine minutes of silence and kneeling. And, you know, it was a, everyone was standing there not knowing what to say. And of course, I had to speak the truth, speak my truth. And I think it was important for people to, to see things from a different perspective that they don't have to see, that they that can always somehow look away from it and use me as an example. Like, well, Daryl Olson, he's, he's, he's a physician. He's got it all. He's doing great. He comes from privilege. And I even mentioned that that, that is a privilege I have. I do come from a, 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 a place of privilege from my way of speaking. But my privilege has an end. And that can easily be pointed to me at times when I don't have a moniker of having the physician's coat and scrubs on, the stethoscope around my neck. Where instead, if it's just me walking down the street in my garb of wearing a, you know, a descendant's hoodie or you know, just me walking down the street alone, then I'd become something different. If they didn't know me in the, you know, the realm of the healthcare provider that they know, the prospective physician at the hospital, what would they know me as? How would they perceive me as? Would they first perceive me as human? Would they perceive me as, you know, physician? Would they perceive me as father, as husband? No, the first thing they see is black man. And, and that comes with a, a, a an unfortunate um, history with it that has led to the, the belief that we are a threat, that we are not afforded the same level of justice that we are not afforded, you know, the the benefit of the the doubt to say first. Let me look at you as a, uh, a human being that lives here on this planet with me. It's more so that you are living here, but I perceive you as lesser than or a threat. Until somebody really gets past that, if they can even get past that inherent bias, mm. have a conversation with you to say. Boy, you're, you're, it's deeper than that. You know, you are, it's like you see a black man with dreads walking down the street. Do you first think physician? Is that what people think? You know, ask yourself that question and, and try to really check your inherent bias at the door. You know, when you hear the word menace, when you hear the word thug, when you hear the word looter, when you hear all those words that are stated, what do you see first in your mind? When you hear the word physician, what do you see? The word nurse. 
but you know, a firefighter, you know, president, um, you know, CEO, all those things that may have inherent bias where somebody thinks they might not think, you know, a black woman or an Asian man or um, a homosexual man or, you know, a transgender woman. You might not think of those things, but all those people can hold those positions as well. <laughs> but nobody, but, but, but your inherent bias gets you into this trap that you have to suddenly look at it and go, I'm not going to be trapped by that. You have to use energy to get yourself out of that trap. And so my ability to speak the truth of what it is to be me, to have people try to walk in my shoes for just the four minutes that I spoke has actually made a lot of people come up to me and start realizing there's a lot to change. There's a lot to truly understand if you just don't go back to the status quo of like, I'm just going to let things ease. The easiest thing for people to do is to listen to that and then discount it. And then just say, I'm just going to let this die down. The hardest part is for people to listen to that and say, I need to change. I need to be introspective and look at some things and I need to change. And I'm talking to people that are physicians and nurses and, and administrators and hospitals who are smart people. And it's like, we're so smart. We, we can treat disease but we can't treat the disease of, of hatred, can't treat the disease of racial inequality. We can recognize that what, what the base problem is and try to take that pathology and make it better. And we should be you know, treating it as a disease and finding the solutions to that, which are, it's broad. You can't just you know, wave a wand. If we can wave a magic wand and do magic, which you know, I always use this phrase as a physician. I go, I'm a, I'm a physician, I'm a magician. I can't do magic, okay? So people have to understand that, that we don't do magical things. We have to base things on realities of science, of data, and how we can move things in the direction. People have to be willing to do that. And so to, to wave a magic wand and say, let's make hatred disappear, it, that's impossible. That is impossible. Here's the reason why. It is the antithesis of love. You can choose to hate. You can choose to love, right? So you have to have those two diametrically opposed you know, ideas that exist in the world to understand what love really is if you know what hate really is. And you can make a decision to choose one or the other. And to say you can wipe away hate, impossibility. What you can do is you can find things that hate may have spawned, such as inequity when it comes to, you know, the wealth gap between individuals or, you know, inequity when it comes to you know, housing or for um, education, for healthcare, all those things that can continue to perpetuate based off of hate and, and the initial true premise of things, a white supremacist attitude that is a false premise in itself that people have supremacy over others in that way based upon a phenotypic change that has nothing to do with anything. So in, until people can start to recognize hate spawns these things and you can fix these things, and make sure that everybody has the opportunity to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. You, you don't have, a, you can't have a good life if you don't have healthcare access that's the same. If you don't have, you know, food access that's the same. Where there's, you know, you know, these big droughts of food for individuals, even in cities and spots. If you don't have, you know, protections to the environment that allow us all to breathe air that's clean or to drink clean water. You know, when you find all these places that would dump industrial waste into neighborhoods that are predominantly black and brown places, it's like, well, that's not giving you the right to life, mm. you know? And people want to preach stuff about their belief in certain things that, you know what, I'm a person of God and I'm a, my God is God of love. Well, do you think your God would appreciate you letting other human beings on this planet die? If, if, you, if you are using that and thinking that well, the only way you can allow that to happen is to think that those human beings aren't human, that you dehumanize individuals and continually do that. So, so yeah. you gotta have health, you gotta have education. An educated society is a society that still functions at a high level. You know, you gotta have, you know, equal justice, equal justice. It can't be a justice system that functions in a dichotomous way, you know? So all these things are, are kind of brought up by talking about the experiences that not only I have, but members of my family have had 
my friends have had, you know, those that I respect and know have had. We've all lived this commonality of experience that we can all talk about. We might be living the highlight in some sense, but you know, the real thing is, do you have power over keeping that high life going? You know, when you suddenly have prominent black individuals speaking out against the inequities that are there, what happens is sometimes those people get blackballed. Sometimes those people don't get work again because the powers that be may say, you know what? Thank you for your service, but I control the power. So until you actually have the ability to control power, when you have people that can sit in a seat and across from you and negotiate on an equal level to say, this is what I'm going to get. And despite you not liking it, I'm still going to get it. That's what people are looking for is that kind of equity, not just handing you 10 pounds of silver and say, be at it and be happy. I gave it to you. If you give me 10 pounds of silver, you can take it away from me if you don't like it. So there, there's a lot. It's, it, it's big, man. It's big. And my speech was just kind of laying it down to say, here's the reality of how I live as a person not just handy, who you respect, ten pounds who has of some, you know, play, who is a person who has, you know, some who has privilege. But you know what? Someone can say your privilege ends because you know what? I don't know you're a doctor. I just know you're that black man walking down the street. So how did you, how did you go from being a doctor, right? Well, how did you go from being a, yeah, well, you, you were a doctor. How did you get into the punk rock? Well, that, that was become awesome. a punk rocker? Because that's like, that's, that's such, it's such a, it's such, such a, it's such a dichotomy. <laughs> like, how do you go from being a doctor to a punk rocker? I mean, it's like I, I was a punk rocker before I was a doctor. So, I mean, that kind of is a thing. But, what? I mean, it's like, you know, I, I looked at, you oh, know, you're so music as a kid, you know, there's certain things that affect you, you know, in a way, move you emotionally at, at points in your life. And, you know, and being like a, you know, a teenager and feeling, you know, somewhat, you know, disaffected, disenfranchised, feeling, you know, like a, an outsider, because every teenager feels that way. Every teenager, no matter what, feels like an outsider in some sense. And, you know, angry, my, you know, my parents were getting divorced and, you know, just feeling angry and trying to find ways to constructively push that anger someplace else. You know, I, I remember a buddy of mine, you know, I, was, I started getting into skateboarding and I was never really good. So, but I was into skateboarding and a buddy brought a tape out, you know, tape said, hey, you need to listen to this. And on the tape, it was the adolescents, the germs, and the angry Samoans. And I heard the, the angry Samoans, I heard the germs, I heard the adolescents, and I was like, this, it spoke to me. Because that raw level of anger, the, the angst, the political disgust, all those things that happened with punk like standing up and saying, you know, though I might feel like I'm an outsider, I'm going to just give you the big, you know, middle finger and say, screw it. I, I'm just, I'm just being me and I'm expressing myself in a way. I screaming at a wall or screaming at you or jumping around and, exp you know, releasing energy in a pit that, that spoke to me. And, and before that, you know, as a kid, there was like, you know, you listen to music and I hear like Iron Maiden and say, wow, I, that, I like that riff. That sounds good. You know, but grew up on listening to, you know, Sly and the Family Stone and, you know, listening to the Isley Brothers, listening to, you know, uh, the Brothers Johnson, you know, Prince, I mean, all that stuff is still a part of me. And listening to music in general is just a, a wonderful way of getting, you know, captured memories and, and imprinting them on your brain. But when I heard the germs, I heard Darby crash growling, I was like, this is, this is what it was. When I heard the angry Samoans and back from Samoa, I'm like, oh, this is it. The adolescence. I was like, and that just took off from there. And so that got me into other bands like the Circle Jerks, Descendants, my Black Flag, Blast. You know, I, I can just keep on naming bands. And then it was like, hey, I, I, this is what moves me. And you hear bands that had political stances, bands that had songs about, you know, being, you know, unrequited love, you know, things that we all went through as, you know, teens thinking what was going to make us up 
as we grew into adulthood, seeing adults do things, you go like, I'm not going to be like them, you know, that's, forget that, you know, I'm not grow up and, <laughs> and then we become, become them too, you know, um, so punk was my thing, and, and as I grew up, I, like I said, I wanted to be a doctor all along, but I liked punk, and then when we came to Chicago, we moved to Chicago, and I got involved with the punk scene here, going to see bands like Naked Ray Gun, you know, and, and you know, that, that kind of made it like, wow, those guys are right there in front of me at the Metro, and I could reach up and, and be there. My goal was like, I'm going to have dinner with those people. I'm going to hang out with them. And, you know, going to these shows, you meet these lifelong people that also felt like they were also cast out, that like they were on the Island of Misfit Toys hanging out together. But we all had this same commonality of the music that we had. And these are people that, to this day, are lifelong people that I know who are friends. And so surviving at shows together, seeing the music together, you know, having that same angst together um, kind of bonded you with this group. And you felt a commonality. You never felt like you were an outsider. You never felt alone. So, so punk is that, you know, surrogate family. It's like your gang that you were in, you know, that you, that you jumped into by being in the pit. And so you know, I, I, I still to this day, you know, it's like meeting the guys at shows, you know, meeting all the guys in the bowling holes at Naked Ray Gun shows. That's how we formed the band by watching these bands and then being at the shows together and then forming a band ourselves. And then we became that band up there that somebody might've seen us. And then they formed a band that keeps passing it on, the, the oral tradition of, I guess, history. Um, so, I mean, punk was something that was the, the, you know, the rebellious stand up to, you know, the, the status quo and, you know, um, make people uncomfortable in a way that, you know, they could be uncomfortable in the first place and make them even more uncomfortable. And then think about that being a, a black man in punk rock, which is kind of the yeah. minority within the minority. It's like, well, that's, you know. that's the other thing. That's the other thing, you see? Because you're not just a doctor, you're a, you're, you're a black punk rocker, which is in itself something, something, something uh, different, if you were. It, it something strange, it, not the norm. I'm a unique individual in this world. There's not many unique people. Yeah. So. You establish some uniqueness. Well, when I see, I see your photos and I see myself. Right. <laughs> I'm like, your hair's wild out. And I'm like, damn, is that me? Is that <laughs> <laughs> so being in, being in the punk world, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Being in the punk world, did you ever face any kind of strangeness? Of course. Like being like a black guy in the, in the punk world, did you, ever, did you ever experience any kind of strangeness? Like, what are you doing in here? Yeah, of course. I mean, that's, there's always, you know, the, the, you stand out at the party, you know, you're, you're there and somebody is interested, either they're really interested because you're there and they want to know what's going on or other people are a little like suspect as to why you're there. Um, and, and most of the time it was like very accepting, you know, because everybody felt as outcasts, you know, that's the thing, you're all outcasts. Um, but, you know, you'd go to some shows and there'd be, you know, some Nazi skins that'd be there and that'd be definitely a problem for anybody that was at the show or we play a show. And there'd be, you know, Nazi skins at the show. And, you know, I'd stage dive and it'd be, that's a risk, you know? So it, it's, there's, there's always, you know, from the standpoint of being who, who you are, you know, you and me understanding that no matter where you go, you're going to be looked at sometimes as the outsider, right? Yeah. So you either can embrace that and walk in and be like, no, I belong up in this place. And that's all you do. Or you can sit back and have that level of other people's level of um, discomfort apply to you, and then you become uncomfortable. So no, it's like, you know, you, you have your allies, you have your people, and you're there, and you know, this is where I want to be, I'm going to be here. You know, it, it's, it, and I have to say, punk rock is, is definitely was an accepting place in some senses, but you know what, in any organization, in any place, you're going to find individuals that may be counter to what you think is the way this should, this should go. I mean, but yes, definitely run into people that had a problem with, you know, me being there, you know, it, it, it's, it's everywhere. You we are, know? we are the, experiencing yeah. some harsh, harsh uh, setbacks here with this damn Wi-Fi. Let me go right here. I'm gonna block these guys. Let me see if we're back anything better. Okay. Hello? Hello? Yes. Okay. There you go. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Yeah, I can. We are going to have to pick this up again, my brother. We are phasing out. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, it's lost. Hello? Because oh, <laughs> he drove away from that Wi Fi. <laughs> Hello? His glasses, too. Because he drives with his glasses. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm wearing my glasses on. He's driving with my glasses on. So, listen, <laughs> I'm going to sign off and sign back in on my, um, on, my, um, on my other one and just do some music now. I okay. Have, if we're phasing in and out, our internet is sucky right here because it's stolen internet. Or well, it's a city internet, actually. <laughs> no problem, man. Brother man, thank you so much for coming on. And I'm going to see if I can get this thing organized. I just have a, a Wi Fi here. Uh, hey, much love, brother. Much love. But man. Thank you so much for coming on. And I'll get you on in a better time when I know my thing is 100%. Ah! Thank you. And I really appreciate you, brother. Of course, man. I appreciate you too, man. Anytime. But say, I don't know if you can still hear me, but there's a reason. There's a reason why I ask you on this show. One, I think you're a big dude. <laughs> Two, there's people that need to see us in a different light. Besides, as you were saying, you know, we, you know, criminal, whatever stuff. But to see that someone is it's still our community. Oh, Reggae is our community, our style is our community, it's still our community. But to see someone in our community that still holds the values of our community. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I'm really proud of you, man. I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm really proud of what you do. Hey, man, I appreciate that. I appreciate it, man. I totally do. It, I'll come on anytime you want, man. I, I, I mean, we got to have two good looking guys on the show with dreads, you know, that's the way it's got to be, you know. Can change it into the double dread thing. <laughs> I'm coming back. I'm gonna come back on.